So parts of this talk that I'm going to give today they come from a, a paper that I co-authored with uh, a great philosopher named Laurie Gruen. And um, that paper is called Veganism as an Aspiration. And it's, it's going to appear in a collection that's coming out in November. And so I can do some self-promotion. Here's what the book looks like. Um, so run out and get buy it right away. Um, and it's, it's, it'll be out in mid-November, The Moral Complexities of Eating Meat. Um, when we first submitted the article, the title of the book was Food for Thought. But some um, ad person thought that the moral complexities of eating meat was catchier. So I, I didn't quite get that. Anyway, um, and, oops, and some, of this, uh, some of this talk comes from discussions I've had with my good friend, who's an Icelandic author, uh, uh, Gunnar Eggersten. Um, so I wanted to put that out there first. Um, I wanted to start out with a quote from Jean-Paul Sartre from a character from one of his plays, Dirty Hands. How you cling to your purity, young man. All right, stay pure. What good will it do? Purity is an idea for a yogi or a monk. Well, I have dirty hands right up to the elbow as I've plunged them in filth and blood. Um, so it's a very dramatic quote, but I think you'll see why I started out the talk with this. So the first thing I want to talk about is our moral inconsistency with regard to animals, our, our kind of what we say versus what we do with regard to non-human animals. Um, here's something I found really fascinating. This is from a Gallup poll from just this year, right? More say animals uh, should have same rights as people, and this is amazing to me. A third of Americans believe animals should be given the same rights as people. Uh, that just floored me. So one out of three Americans think that animals should have the same rights as people. That's, that's hard to believe, but that's what the, that's what the, uh, the results of the um, survey said. But at the same time, this, this doesn't surprise me. <laughs> Americans buy nearly 1,500 McDonald's hamburgers a minute, right? So um, the disparity between what we say about how we feel about animals and what we how we treat other animals reflects a, a profound moral inconsistency. Um, most people are not aware, or most people are now aware of the extreme suffering that uh, animals are routinely experience raised for different kinds of things like farming and, and uh, for food. So I want to give you some numbers and I want to talk about some, some factory farming conditions. I'm, o I'm only going to show you about a 10 second clip of something that's kind of disturbing, but, it's, but um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not the kind of thing that you would see that is uh, you know, like a PETA video for 10 minutes. But I'm not going to show it right now. I'll give you a trigger warning then. Um, so here's some figures that I think are interesting. Um, the amount of animals that are killed by hunters in the United States, right? Doves and squirrels. and So it's, I mean, it's, it's quite a, a number. Uh, it's a, is this, per year? this is annual. Yeah, annual figures for hunting in the United States. Um, so it's about 200 million sentient beings. And when I use the term sentient beings, I mean beings who are, have the ability to experience pain and pleasure. So, for example, we can say that a cat is sentient, but a rock isn't sentient. Right? So the difference between a rock and a cat, one difference, importantly, is that the cat feels pain. So that's what I mean by sentient. Um, how about in laboratories? We don't really know because it's hard to keep uh, track of how many uh, non-human animals are killed in laboratories um, for different regulatory reasons, but it's somewhere between 17 to 100 million in labs. Um, uh, for fur, somewhere between 8 and 10 million are killed for fur in the United States. Um, now, in the United States, when it comes to slaughter for food, it's, uh, the numbers are, are gigantic. So I'm, when I speak today, the reason I want to focus on the use of animals as food is because the number, just the pure numbers compared to animals in laboratories, which I do believe, you know, the fur industry and the lab, uh, animal experimentation industry, 
Um, these are important aspects of animal ethics, but the numbers are so, they so outweigh the numbers of, of these, other, um, this, these other institutions. But I think it's important to focus on the number produced for food. Not only is it about pure numbers, but it's most of us, a vast majority of us, our interactions with animals come at least three times a day when we sit down to eat. So many of us, few of us have interaction with animals in laboratories or not, you know, the number of hunters isn't that large compared to the number of people who eat meat. So that's part of the reason why I'm going to focus on that. So in the United States, the figure is about 9.1 9 .1 billion with a B. Right? So how many human beings are walking the planet today? About 7.5 billion. So each year, globally, more than the entire population of human beings on the planet are slaughtered for food sentient beings um, globally. So I want to talk about animals raised for, raised for food globally. We have one, about 1 billion cattle, 1 billion pigs, 40 billion, 40 billion chickens. 40, that's about, what's that, about seven times the population of the, of the humans on the planet. Uh, about 10 or 20 billion uh, fish, aquaculture. So Globally, it's somewhere around 50 to 60. Some people put it at 100 billion, but the number's gigantic, the number of sentient beings that are, that are killed for food. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about, not spend a lot of time, but talk a little bit about uh, the production of food in the in, in, uh, industrial settings, because a vast majority, about 90, between 95 and 98% uh, of our food comes from industrial farms. Um, so most people are aware of the extreme suffering e experienced by animals raised for consumption in industrialized meat and dairy pr production facilities. Most of us have seen undercover videos on the internet and, and what we discover, this is an example of what's called a concentrated animal feeding operation, operation or a CAFO. Um, a CAFO is just like another word for that is a factory farm. Um, According to the USDA, the USDA um, uh, about, as I said, ab about 9 billion animals in the United States are killed for food. Uh, most of these animals are confined indoors. They spend their entire lives uh, in, in, in confined spaces. Um, and there's a lot of different procedures that I can talk about. Um, for example, with uh, chickens, they have their beaks cut off because they will peck each other. And so the beaks are cut off. It's a very painful procedure. Um, that's done without anesthesia. When it comes to pigs, um, their tails are docked. Sometimes their teeth are filed. Their ears are docked, all without anesthesia. So there's a lot, there's a lot of uh, procedures that are, cause pain and suffering. Um, and you know, I can get into the details. I won't spend a lot of time on the details, but I'll just show you. This is a dairy farm. This is confinement. This is uh, sow stalls, so these pigs are kept in these stalls for about 180 days, um, and they can't move around, they can't bend down, they, can't, they basically can just plop down or stand up, they can't turn or anything. So they spend six months in these crates uh, before they're turned into pork products. And uh, hens are kept in what are called battery cages, and here's a, an example of a battery cage. So this is the wingspan of a hen, and this is how many hens are put into this space, so they can't ever in their entire lives, can they ever spread their wings, and they, their, uh, their feet get injured on the wire bottoms. So um, needless to say, and we can talk about the details of it, but I'm, I'm just going to ask you to accept for, if you don't, if this isn't enough, just accept on faith right now that the conditions in uh, factory farms are harmful to animals. They suffer while they're alive and then they suffer at the time of slaughter. So you might ask the question, what about humane meat? And sometimes you'll see this presented as locavorism or compassionate carnivorism or conscientious omnivore movement or sustainable meat movement or the humane meat movement or the happy meat movement or the nose to tail food movement. And you'll see terms like cage-free, and grass-fed, and organic, and natural, and cage-free. So these are all 
terms that we see if we go over to Whole Foods. Whole Foods is they have cruelty-free meat and stuff like that. What does that mean for cru to have cruelty-free meat? What is humane meat? What is that? Because I think a lot of people have good intentions. We have good intentions. When we discover the horrors of factory farming, we might say, I don't want to contribute to that. If I'm going to get my chicken or my pork or my eggs, I want to make sure it's free range and it's, it's humane. So let me talk a little bit about why I don't think that humane meat is actually humane. So let's talk about ways in which humane meat suffers. How about in the dairy industry? Because as you see from the title of my talk, I'm going to argue for veganism. Now you might say, why aren't you arguing, arguing just for vegetarianism? What's wrong with meat? I mean, what's wrong with eggs and dairy and cheese? That's not killing the animal. Um, but let's talk about how, for example, dairy is produced. Dairy takes a female, a cow, and they have to be impregnated. A cow is a mammal, and mammals, need, when they lactate, when they're pregnant, they lactate, so they have to be kept pregnant. They lactate, that's the milk that we use for dairy products. Their tails are docked. When their calves are born, if they're male, many of them are removed from the mother uh, within the first three days, and then they are used to produce veal, right? They produce about seven, or seven to 10 gallons of milk a day, which is how they've been bred, but that's very hard on their bodies. So the normal lifespan of a cow is about 20 years, but the, the lifespan of a cow is about five years, three to five years, and what happens is the cow produces milk, 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 and then the cow's body cannot produce milk anymore. The, some of the calcium will leach from the bones, the cow's bones get brittle, the, the milk production wanes, and they become used, they're not useful as dairy pro producers, so then they're just sent to make hamburger. So hamburger is just a product of the dairy industry. So if you're drinking milk, you're drinking the secretion of an animal that you're going to eat in the hamburger. So if you're interested in decreasing harm and suffering, then by not eating the hamburger and drinking the milk, you're, you're actually contributing to the same industry that produces these products, right? So there's a problem with dairy. 